Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust, and we are exploring the Atlanta History Center today, and have we got an incredible treat for you right now. Joining me is my friend Gordon Jones. He's the chief military curator here at the Atlanta History Center. And Gordon, we're standing inside a monumental piece of artwork. Tell us about it. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, this, this is probably the greatest and certainly the largest artifact that we have here at the Atlanta History Center. This is the 1886 cyclorama painting known as the Battle of Atlanta. It depicts the Battle of July 22, 1864, uh, just east of Atlanta. Uh, this in its day was a form of sort of the virtual entertainment. This was immersion. This, this was the coolest form of entertainment that you could get in the 1880s. And think about in the 1880s, what you had seen about the American Civil War if you're the American public. You can see some woodcuts in newspapers. You can see some Courier and Ives illustrations. You might see some stereo cards, but you're not gonna see large photographs. Uh, that hasn't been done yet. You're not gonna see uh, film. You're not gonna see color pictures and you're sure not gonna see anything as big as this. So when you walked in here, this just knocked your socks off. The point was an illusion. All right, it's a 360 degree painting, 371 feet in circumference, 49 feet high. You can't see where the painting ends in your peripheral vision because it goes on forever. You can't see where the sky ends because you have this canopy over my head, like a stage curtain in effect. And you can't see where the painting ends at the ground because you have what was called the faux terrain or the diorama. So the idea was that you would be immersed in this space. And for audiences of the time, that was fantastic. But remember also that this was only one of about 20 Civil War cycloramas that were floating around. These were traveling attractions. They were all made to be a standard size to fit into standard size buildings so they could travel. So yeah, I know people are gonna ask, is this the largest painting in the world? Is Gettysburg the largest painting in the world? No, they're about the same size because they were all designed to go in the same buildings. But the Gettysburg and the Atlanta are the only two Civil War cycloramas uh, that remain today. There are other ones overseas, there's lots of others in Europe. There's, there's a crucifixion scene in Quebec, but we are mighty lucky uh, to be able to interpret this wonderful artifact here at the Atlanta History Center. Now, when you talk about uh, these paintings being built to fit buildings, you guys had to make a building to fit the painting, didn't you? Exactly. This, this painting, as uh, older folks will remember, was in Grant Park, about uh, eight miles from here. And during about, beginning about 10 years ago, we undertook the process of raising money and undertaking a new location for this painting. So we built the building for this. We moved the painting from its old location. This was a huge engineering and logistical feat. We brought it into this space. Uh, we did a complete restoration and we did sort of a reinterpretation of it too because it had been kind of hiding down there in Grant Park and a lot of Atlantans felt like it was just sort of this Confederate thing and it had always been there. And we wanted to tell the vast complexity of the many stories that this painting tells, including first and foremost, that it was painted in Milwaukee for white northern middle class audiences. It was never intended to be in Atlanta. It was to celebrate a northern victory. Now, Chris, let me show you a couple things that we can that we can show you that that that, that demonstrate how this painting was read by Northern audiences in the 1880s. Fantastic, because this painting is just filled with stories. The story of the cyclorama itself is a fascinating story. We're gonna look at some of that in just a second. But this painting captures a lot of different stuff happening all at once. And we're gonna have our Swami here open up his crystal ball <laughs> to share his insights. I wanna give a quick thanks to Chris White behind the camera. He's gonna be zooming in on some of these things through some of the B-roll he's captured for us. He's really been doing a great job to help us see some of this stuff up close. Gordon. All right, well, let's drift, drift over this way, uh, Chris. And you, I think you can see behind me uh, the big red brick house. This is the Troop Hurt House. And this is the central part of the action here in the Battle of Atlanta Cyclorama. And just behind the Troop Hurt House uh, is the Federal Line. And you can kind of see 
the, uh, and I'll, I'll point out the entrenchments that formed uh, the federal line. And what has happened here in the battle is that the Confederates who are approaching from Atlanta, all right, so this is west, from traveling from west to east, and you can see the spires of Atlanta off to the west, they have mounted a surprise attack about four o'clock in the afternoon of July 22nd. They've broken through at the Troop Hurt House and they've captured the DeGress battery, the, De the battery of Captain Francis DeGress, 1st Illinois uh, Artillery Battery H. These are four 20-pounder Parrot guns. And that is their greatest success of the day. But where we are right now, right now when the painters imagine this scene, they set it at 4.45 in the afternoon, right when the shattered 15th Corps was rallying and the entire Army of the Tennessee was about to retake the Troop Hurt House, retake the DeGress Battery, and it was became this heroic moment that would have been well known to Northern audiences at the time. So I like to think that what is happening in this painting where you're really sort of on the cusp of the Northern victory. You're seeing these guys about to push the Confederates back out of the line. It's kind of like when your team in the championship game, you know the story of the game. You know that your team won in a field goal in the last three seconds. And when you see the footage of that football about to be kicked through the goalpost, you say, oh, I know what's going to happen. This is that sublime moment when it hasn't happened yet, but we know what's getting ready to happen, and this is super exciting. And that's the way these audiences were looking at this, especially, especially the veterans of the Atlanta campaign and their children, because they, the children, wanted to know, hey, Dad, what did you do in the war? This is 22 years after the events. So they want to know about that. Now, I want to jump in real quick because you say, hey, Dad, what did you do in the war? There are some, what, 6,000 people in this painting. There's an opportunity for every dad to say, well, look, here I am over here in this spot. Um, one of the things that I think is brilliant as we were walking down here, there are statistics painted on the wall. We'll talk about this. And at the very end, it mentions that 6,000 people, you decide. And it really invites, in the same way that Civil War era or post-Civil War era audiences, invites you to interact with the painting that way. I think that's brilliant. Well, I dare say that not many people have actually sat down and counted um, all um, 6,000 figures, but, well, okay, we know one geek that did that uh, before the opening. Uh, and but I would if I had the chance. He would, yes. <laughs> um, but the, the, the point is, is look, these artists were very good at what they did because there's probably at least 20,000 soldiers fighting in this area at 4.45 in the afternoon. But they're represented by about 6,000 figures. So that, that shows you something about the, the, the artist's skill in sort of this, uh, presenting this illusion of this chaotic battle. So let's, let's talk, uh, uh, Chris, for just a second about a couple of the specific individuals in this thing. And uh, again, this is painted for a northern audience. So what you're going to see is the, um, the, first of all, you're going to see the DeGress battery. All right. You see that, that two of its guns have been, uh, are still facing toward the onrushing Confederates. Two of them have been turned back toward the now onrushing Federals. All the guns were spiked, so to turn those two guns around really didn't mean anything. It was just supposed to scare uh, the own rushing uh, Union Army. Now, there are 27 figures, 27 Union officers that are identified by name and specifically painted by feature, so to be recognizable to the audience. There is not a single Confederate a single Confederate depicted in the painting. Why? Because, well, it was meant for Northern audiences. We didn't care about Confederates. Um, but you see in this mass of Confederates down here, there's a couple of officers. Neither one of them are identified. Probably one of them should be. That probably would have been Arthur Middleton Manigo, who commanded Manigo's brigade, who captured the DeGress battery. But it's not. 
he's not specifically identified. But when we go downstairs, I can show you how we made up for that lack of historical accuracy in the painting. Let's go over here for another example. And one of the things as we walk over in this direction, um, there's so much there's so much for us to look at. And you could come in here and study this for hours and find all sorts of cool little surprises as you go. So over here, you can see the real hero of the, of the scene, all right? The largest figure in the painting is General Blackjack Logan, Alexand uh, John Alexander Logan, riding on the black horse, waving his hat in the air, famous Illinois politician, vice presidential candidate in 1884, instrumental in founding the Grand Army of the Republic and in Memorial Day, which we celebrate today. He was a well-known celebrity figure at the time, but he, and he really did help to rally the Union Army um, and, and his own 15th Corps uh, to retake the Degress's battery. And then right behind him uh, is Captain Francis Degress himself, bareheaded with a pistol in his hand, following up because he can't stand the idea of his battery being captured. So he's running after it. He's gonna be among the first to reclaim his battery as soon as they get there. Now, above their heads, uh, you see up on the hill up there, little white house. Uh, that is actually General Sherman's headquarters. And the painters actually did put Sherman in the painting. If you look over to the left of the house, through the tree line into a little clearing, you see a figure on a brown horse. That is General Sherman on his horse, Duke, uh, surveying the whole scene. So they were trying to put in these actual historical figures. Now, my favorite historical figure, he's kind of hidden. And as I talked uh, uh, earlier, there, this painting reveals itself in really cool ways and because of the structure that we're in. We can't see him from where we're at, but if we come over here in just a, a few feet, um, the diorama actually extends the story out to see us. There's a telegraph pole here pointing up. And I know that Chris can probably capture this through his fabulous camera work. There above the clouds is not some old buzzard as I thought when I first came in here, but it's old Abe the War Eagle. And it makes perfect sense, particularly if we consider that this painting was first uh, exhibited in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Old Abe was with the 8th Wisconsin and part of the uh, Live Eagle Brigade. And so uh, even those great hometown heroes make special cameo appearances uh, in this painting. We've got 360 degrees of fine detail, uh, cool stories. I mean, there's just story after story as you go foot by foot down the Chris, painting. Chris, there's, there's one problem with that story about Old Abe. Yeah? Actually, there's two problems. Uh, probably. Yeah, you know what? Because they never let the eagle off <laughs> his tether lest he fly away, right? And, oops, the 8th Wisconsin was never actually here at the Battle of Atlanta. <laughs> but let's not let that get in the way right. of a salute to some hometown heroes. That's what we call a little bit of artistic license. And this painting is... It is not a snapshot of the battle in 1864. It's a snapshot of what people thought it should look like 22 years later. So there's, it's a mix of history and artistic license. That's what old Abe is. <laughs> As we, uh, anything else you want to point out? Because we're going to go behind the scenes of this painting in just a second. And as Gordon said, we've got some artifacts that physically tie into this story as well. Anything else you want to point out before we head downstairs? Yeah, let's, let's look over here for one, one other thing that I want to point out. Um, we'll walk over here. couple things here. Uh, first of all, we mentioned that, uh, of course, the veterans wanted to see where they had fought. And over here on the eastern horizon, you see Stone Mountain. Just as you saw up there on the northern horizon, you saw uh, Sherman's headquarters. Well, these features were actually several miles away, and they wouldn't have been nearly as large as what you see in the painting. You know, General Sherman over there would have been standing about 18 feet tall, um, but the perspective is exaggerated, stepped up, so that the viewer can see better what is going on. Another thing that is, is interesting here is, all right, we've got 6,000 figures in this painting. There are no women, 
and there is only one African American. General Sherman did not allow black combat regiments in the front lines in this battle, but that doesn't mean that there weren't some African Americans here because there were uh, what were called the cooks or the undercooks, there were wagon drivers, and these guys were detailed as teamsters and most commonly as stretcher bearers. So you probably might have seen a few more African Americans in this painting, but honestly, it was, it was by no means, you know, it's not like the artists are intentionally trying to leave something out. There is one African American figure in the painting. I'm going to point him out. He's right here. You can see him there with my pointer. Now, if you can get in tight on that, I'm just going to ask everybody to think about what is that scene? What is going on in that scene? You have a guy on a horse and a, a riderless horse right behind him. Then you've got a guy on the ground. You can see the two legs, right? Brown trousers. And you have a man standing, a federal soldier standing, gesticulating to the, to the black man on the horse and another one leaning over the person on the ground. What is that? The artist never told us, and we don't know. And you can imagine it to be anything you want. But I'm thinking that in the context of the 19th century, just as this painting was all about Union victory, this might have been a nod to emancipation uh, to those white northern middle class audiences saying, yeah, we not only saved the Union, but oh yes, and by the way, and it was kind of a by the way at that time, we also freed the enslaved people. That might be what's going on. That gesticulating man might be saying something to the effect of, you know, go young man, you are free. And as paternalistic as that sounds, that would be in keeping with the character of the time. One of the uh, things I think is really cool about this spot, we can see the railroad stretching off. And over the course of this entire trip, we've talked about the railroad, the railroad, the railroad, and how important that's been, how central it's been to the movement of the armies and the overall story. And this painting is full of those sorts of uh, nods and acknowledgments to the larger story of Atlanta, not just this moment in the afternoon of the battle, but we see cotton, we see railroads, uh, we see the city. Um, so we've got all these themes that are tying in. What we're going to do now is head downstairs and take a look behind the scenes and some of these components that Gordon has talked about and tie them back in to the cyclorama experience. Now, of course, being here is the absolute key thing here. It's just a fantastic experience. All what we're capturing on film is great. I'm glad we're given the chance to share this with you, but you've got to come here. You've got to stand on this platform. You've got to see this for yourself because this is incredible stuff. And the team that has put this together and made this uh, experience possible, um, I just can't commend you guys enough for the work that you've done. Thanks. Yeah, and, and there's nothing like seeing the real thing, right? This is it. This is an experience. And uh, what we also wanted to do was to bring back the experience of 1886. So this painting has been restored to the way it looked in 1886 as best we can tell from the period photographs and the platform is constructed as close as we can to the experience that you would have in 1886. Not where the platform revolves, that's a modern anathema. You, the visitor, you are the motion in this picture. Now speaking of motion, I'm going to ask Chris White and his stunt camera work to step backwards as we go down the escalator and he's got to find his way. We don't want him to trip and we're going to just clam up for just a second. What makes this entire cyclorama experience so successful is that the History Center here has really made an effort to help people understand how the cyclorama works as a piece of art. So we're going to stop here for a second. And Gordon, what are we looking at now that we're behind the painting? Yeah, look up. All right. When I said that this was primarily a logistical and engineering challenge to move this painting, uh, and to relocate it here in this new building, now you get an idea. This is, this is what the 49 feet tall uh, looks like. 
And we wanted to allow people to have this experience to look behind the painting, to, to sort of look behind the curtain, as it were. When you're up on the platform, you're in the land of illusion. And when you're down here, you're in the land of what it takes to make that illusion. So, and if you take a look, you can see as Chris is panning up and down the height of the painting, you can see that there's a slight concavity to the painting uh, in order for the painting to actually work to help create not only that three-dimensionality to it, but also just because of the way the fabric hangs and holds because it's so heavy, it actually has to have this shape to it. Uh, and you can see over here on the side how it's actually anchored in the bottom and you can see that hourglass shape there. Gordon, tell us a little bit about the physics of this. Right, I mean, it's, this is kind of contrary to what you would think of with, with textile artifacts, but the way these things were rigged uh, was designed to have some tension on the bottom and on the top so that it literally was a stretch. Um, and that would keep the canvas taut, which is what gives it the hourglass shape. But it also is a situation where it helps the illusion because the, um, as you see the, with the hourglass shape, the point that is actually closest to you uh, on the platform is is where that hyperbolic shape is the closest or right around the horizon point so when you're standing on the platform the horizon is physically the closest to you even though with the illusion it's supposed to look like the furthest point away it's the vanishing point if you will so the artists were able to figure out and use that hyperbolic shape to their advantage so now what we're going to do, we've seen behind the scenes, we're going to tie into some of those things that Gordon has talked about that help bring this experience even more to life for us. Before we do, I want to point out this painting behind me, uh, this photo behind me. It's actually uh, the team of painters who put this together. And Gordon said, oh yeah, I love this picture. Tell me, what are we looking at here? Who are these folks? Well, these are, this is our crew of 17 German and Austrian artists. Uh, this is on June the 6th, 1886. And they're standing on the scaffold in the uh, studio in Milwaukee, and this is essentially their press opening photograph. This is their publicity photograph when the painting was finished. So this is our painting behind the guys, and here are our lead painters. This is uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Heine, who had a lot of experience painting this kind of thing in the Franco-Prussian War, and Theodore Davis, who was the uh, combat correspondent and artist for Harper's Weekly who was at the Battle of Atlanta and knew all the top brass uh, in the Union Army and worked as the historical advisor for the American Panorama Company and it was him who put in a lot of those identified Union figures. He was friends with Logan, he was friends with DeGrasse, he was friends with all of them. That may be how they ended up in the painting. And we have some artifacts over here, Chris, that, that speak to that. You know, we did our restoration uh, and we wanted it to be as true to 1886 as possible. So, you know, if the artist made a mistake in 1886, we kept it. Uh, we're not gonna correct anything, it's just an artifact. But we can sort of show you some of the things that maybe weren't quite expressed there uh, in the painting. We can show you that in these cases. Uh, for example, here's Francis de Gress's pistol. Uh, you see the pistol that he's wearing, that he's carrying uh, as he's uh, riding back to retake his battery? It looks an awful lot like that. I wonder if Theodore Davis, who was friends with de Gress, had seen that pistol. We don't know. That came from the de Gress family. Here's another one. Now, the most famous casualty of the day was uh, Major General John James B. McPherson, uh, who was killed earlier in the day. He's not actually in the painting, but his body is in the painting. He's being carried in an ambulance up to Sherman's headquarters. This was his uh, camp chest that we acquired. And um, believe it or not, yeah, here's this. Do you really think, Chris, that this is the bullet that actually killed McPherson in that little box? Well, for years, this was displayed at the Cyclorama in Grant Park as that very uh, relic. I don't believe it, but what's interesting is that in a town that celebrates Confederate heroes, they, can, they celebrated McPherson, and of course, McPherson was the first Civil War soldier to get a monument 
in Atlanta, a Union general in 1877. Let me show you one other thing around here on this side. We talked about Arthur Middleton Manigo. He was he's not in the painting, maybe he should be. Well, we have his sword on exhibit here. Uh, this is the sword that the South Carolina general was carrying in the battle. And what is wonderful about it is this is the sword that was presented to him for his service in the Mexican War. At the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, a bullet passed through the scabbard. He was holding the sword out at the time. The bullet passed through the scabbard right through where the inscription reads. Um, and then he kept, and he kept using it. So it's a battle-scarred battle artifact that the man was actually using in the Battle of Atlanta. This came to us about two months before opening from a descendant of the Manigo family. And it was like curator's gift from God. It was wonderful. Now, in our introductory video, Gordon mentioned, you know, you come to a museum because they've got the stuff and it helps you connect with the history and experience it, understand it, and, and uh, really be able to put yourself in touch with that story. We've got some great artifacts here that help bring this story uh, of the painting to life for us. And we want you to come here to the Atlanta History Center, put yourself in these footsteps, look at these artifacts, connect with this story, explore, be wowed, because that's what this painting really is all about. Gordon, I want to thank you for showing us around and spending so much time deciphering in your Swami-like fashion this great story. I want to thank Chris White and his great work behind the camera. I want to thank Gary for popping in and out like a little jack-in-the-box, as he always does. And I want to thank you for supporting us here in Atlanta and the work that you do to support battlefield preservation and education.